Hello everyone, I am Simone and after a very long time, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about Indian communities in Africa that, in the last 200 years, played a primary role in the economy, history and culture of the countries they settled in. However, before starting, we might point out that the relation that links India and Africa it is not a one-way road. In millions of people of Indian descent, as we will see in this video, are present in Africa, it is equally true that tens of thousands of people of African descent are present in India. In fact, the largest democracy in the world got, in 2020, its first politician of African descent. He is called Shantaram Siddhi and took charge as a member of the Karnataka Legislative Council. Mr. Siddi belongs to the Siddi community, whose members are descendants of East Africans who were brought to India from the 17th century to serve as warriors, courtiers or slaves. It is a small community located mostly in central western India that has no more than 50,000 members. I have previously analyzed in my videos about the five sultanates of the Deccan the important contributions that the ancestors of the Siddi community brought from Africa gave to medieval India. So, if you would like to learn more about this interesting topic, I suggest you to watch the two videos of which I leave the links here. Ok, let's start with the main topic of the video. The history of relations between India and Africa dates back to several centuries ago, even before the time of the Mughal domination over the subcontinent. This history is made up of commercial exchanges, economic relations, but also of prejudices and ideological issues. This special relation begins from afar, and is connected with the history of three continents, Asia, Africa and Europe, and with the most important geopolitical and economic events of the last two centuries. In fact, if the history of Africa has reached the politics of India, that of India has been intertwined with that of the African continent for centuries. There are currently around 3 million people of Indian descent in Africa, mainly located in the southern and eastern regions. They are the descendants of the multitude of people who arrived or were brought here during the 19th century by the British, who favored the immigration of the Indians, especially those from the Gangetic Valley and from Tamil Nadu, and they employed them mainly as laborers, also known as coolies, in a system of particular indentured labor schemes. By then, the British Empire suddenly found itself with an immense territory to manage and a severe shortage of cheap labor force. Following the gradual abolition of slavery in all the territories of the British Empire, sanctioned by the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 and Britain's low birth rate, had at one point made nearly impossible for the English colonies to function. There was a great need for cheap labor to be employed in plantations and in the construction of infrastructures in the territories that gradually became part of the British Empire from the mid-19th century during the so-called Scramble for Africa. Although that kind of indentured labor was not, at least officially, assimilable to actual slavery, was close enough to it, with highly awful and harsh living and working conditions for all of those involved. Indians essentially constituted an excellent economic workforce and an alternative to the former slaves and English colonies who, for various reasons, were reluctant to settle in the torrid and unhealthy climates of Africa. Masses of indentured laborers were therefore sent to South Africa and Mauritius to work on sugarcane plantations or to Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya to build roads and railways. Most of the actual Indo-Africans are the descendants of these souls. However, there is a small but powerful minority that descend from traders' communities and members of colonial public administration, sent from India to Africa following the dominant British colonial theory that Indians were better when led by other Indians. The Indian communities prospered thanks to the autarky adopted by the British Empire, which required the purchase of goods within the empire and prohibited the management of trade and administration for non-citizens. So, besides labors, this new middle class, made up of the cadres of the colonial administration, poured overseas and contributed to the rise of a new class of traders and businessmen, and then of landowners throughout East Africa. After 1947, the same region witnessed a second wave of migration. This time, professionals and businessmen relocated to Africa and reinforced the pre-existing Indian communities to clash, however, after a few years, with the struggle for the independence of African states and the consequent Africanization of the economy and local powers. The 1960s were crucial years especially for Indian communities in East Africa, which, at the end of the decade, had to face a new diaspora, a real exodus. In fact, by the early 1960s, when Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania gained independence, there were in those countries about 360,000 citizens of Indian descent. 
but despite their small number, they represented the majority of traders, shopkeepers, public administration employees and businessmen. For this reason, in East Africa, especially in Uganda and Kenya, they became the targets of the nationalist propaganda of the new African political classes in the aftermath of the independence. Indians, and Asians in general, were accused of having somehow maintained a kind of privileged relation with the British colonizers and, when British left, to hold a large chunk of local economic power by replacing them. The presence of Asians was perceived as a real barrier to the redistribution of wealth within the newborn African states. In the aftermath of independence, Indians faced a lot of threat coming mainly from the nationalizations of their properties and businesses. Plus, in few cases, they were also forced to leave the country. For example, as part of his national discourse, the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin accused the Indian community of milking the Ugandan cow without feeding it, and decided to nationalize all commercial activities run by Indians and to expel them from the national territory in 1972. The community, that was counting back then circa 75,000 people, was given just 90 days to pack their bags and leave the country. What happened in Uganda was followed by similar events in Kenya, where laws had been enacted banning foreigners from running shops or businesses and giving Kenyans preference in the public administration jobs. Citizens of Indian origin expelled from Africa relocated mainly to the United States, Canada or the UK. Many of them, however, began to return to Africa in the 1980s and 90s and demanded, in a few cases, compensation for the persecution they suffered and the property they lost. On the other hand, countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe and Madagascar had adopted less discriminatory policies towards Indian citizens, as did also Mozambique. Nowadays, the largest and most well-established community, counting about 1.3 million people, lives in South Africa. The majority of them lives in and around Durban, which is one of the largest Indian cities outside Indian borders. The Indian community in South Africa is one of the oldest and most numerous in the whole continent. The most notorious member of this community was certainly Mahatma Gandhi, that began here in South Africa his struggle against the British Empire that eventually led to the independence of India. Apart from him, we can notice that many South African Indians also played important roles in the country's history. Many of the protagonists of the struggle against apartheid have declared that they have found a source of inspiration in the actions of Mahatma Gandhi. Some members of the Indian community, such as Ahmed Katrada, had even spent years in prison with Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu. Another very strong community is the one living in Kenya, counting nowadays about 100,000 people. A significant Indian migration to Kenya began after the creation of the British Protectorate of East Africa in 1895. Many Indians worked, and many died, in the construction of the Mombasa-Nairobi Railway. Despite what was experienced during the stormy years of independence, today the Indian community is actively involved in the socio-economic and political life of the country. For the longest time, there was no presence of Indians in Kenyan politics. This has, however, changed in the recent past, with Indians actively taking part in politics and some of them are also members of the parliament. The inclusion of Indian community in the Kenyan society is such that they were recently acknowledged as the 44th tribe of the country. In Uganda, a country where, as we've seen, the local Indian community was the main target of Idi Amin's nationalizations and expulsions that forced them to move to Great Britain, Canada and the United States, Indians started returning in small numbers in the late 1980s. That occurred because, after the fall of Idi Amin, the Ugandan president Yoweri Museveni promoted a law that allowed Indians to return to Uganda, repurchase their properties and invest there to help the economy to recover. Nowadays, the Ugandan Indian community is made up by approximately 30,000 individuals. Another country where the Indian presence played and still plays a central role is Mauritius, where Indians constitute the majority of the 1.3 million inhabitants. Mauritius was the first colony of the British Empire to import, in 1834, workers from India to be employed in the local plantations. The Indian community in Mauritius, largely from the Indian state of Bihar, has made a point of honor, like all other Indian communities in Africa, in keeping its traditions, cultures, languages and religions alive. After independence, unlike other African countries, no Africanization took place in Mauritius, mainly because most of its population was composed by Indians. This has led to the creation of privileged commercial and economic relations with the motherland. 
Other prominent Indian communities in Africa live in Réunion, about 220,000 people, Mozambique, about 70,000 people, Tanzania, 60,000 people, and Madagascar, 25,000 people. And there are still strong links between India and Africa. Moreover, in the recent years, the economic and geopolitical ties between African countries and India have considerably straightened, which will hopefully also translate into an improved acceptance of the local Indian communities in the eyes of the African populations. Okay, friends, we have reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, diving into this topic and researching the history of the Indian presence in Africa and the current situation. In case you have the opportunity to relate to what is reported in it, share your experiences and those of your families in this important aspect of African and Indian history. See you in the next video. Do not forget to like and subscribe to my channel.